Take your Bibles tonight and let's turn over to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17, if you would. 1 Samuel 17. This is really unusual to preach before people now. This is kind of scary. <laughs> but anyway, bear with us tonight. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to look at verses 20 through 29. And we'll look a little bit, review the story some. Most everybody knows this story very well. But I think it will fit in right now with what we've been going through in our country and around the world. So if you found your place, let's stand. We're going to read verse 20 through 29. Starting in verse number 20, it says, And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that a man who killeth him, the king, will enrich him with great riches and give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. But verse 29, we've all heard it and read it before. And David said, What? Have I, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Father, again tonight, I pray that you'd be in this service. Thank you again for the opportunity to meet. And Father, I pray this is just the beginning, and very soon we'll be able to get back to complete normal Sunday school and everything as it used to be, Lord. And Father, we know that you make no mistakes, and Lord, your hand is in control of everything that's going on. But Lord, help us to be faithful and help us not to slack off in any area, but Lord, to be faithful to you. And Lord, we're going to praise you tonight for what you do, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to look also, if you would, at Proverbs chapter 29 and look at verse number 18. Proverbs 29 and verse number 18. In verse 18, the Bible says this, where there is no vision, the people what? perish but they that keep the law the man but he that keepeth the law happy is he i want you to think about this verse in particular that word vision literally means a dream without a dream and without a vision do you know what happens people perish and that word perish is very interesting it means to loosen dismiss or go back if we lose our vision do you know what we're going to do we're going to get backslidden we'll backslide on god I want to speak tonight on this, the subject, spiritual assassins. You know, here about three weeks ago while we were online, I preached on the assassin of prayerlessness. Do you remember that? About how that we need to pray. That's one of the main weapons we have as Christians against the devil and his crowd. But I want you to think tonight about what the problem really is. One of the spiritual assassins is this. It's, it's the, the killer of pessimism. You know what? We're going through all we're going through right now, and I'm sure that some, is this on? It's not. You should have hollered at me, Joe. So you never, you never had a problem hollering before. <laughs> but anyway, you know, a lot of people, they're going through this time right now, and I think the world, and even some Christians, they think, boy, you know, it's coming to an end. It's all over. We're, we're losing out. We're not going to be able to live for the Lord like we once did. And sometimes people, when they get in that condition, they literally backslide. They quit doing what they once did, and they're not faithful like they once were. But I want you to think of the word pessimism also, because that's the killer, pessimism. And what it, what it results in is a lack of vision. You say, well, I just don't think it's going to happen, so why should I have a vision? Why should I dream? 
We need to continue. We don't want to quit. This is not a time to quit. But that word pessimism means this. It means to question or to doubt. We should not be doubting anything today. God has allowed what's taken place for his glory. Amen? And we need to look at it that way. Look back, if you would, at 1 Samuel chapter 17 again. And look at verse number 26 one more time. And then we're going to look at also verse number 37. But back over there at 1 Samuel chapter 17. And look at, first off at verse number 26. I want you to notice David's attitude about this. In verse number 26, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For, now notice this. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? You know, right there you saw his spiritual character. He said, I don't care how big, how great, no matter who they are, they have no right to stand up against our God and his army. Well, I like that. He was not going to quit. And what he said to his brothers down in verse number 29, is there not a cause? He believed that with all of his heart. And that's what we need to do. Uh, look at verse 37 of that same chapter. And here we see a, another aspect of David. Verse number 37. In verse 37, it says, David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. You know what? I saw his faith in God. It was not diminished one bit, not even a little bit. He said, This man is no different than that bear, that lion. Uh, they attack, and if he attacks, I'm going to destroy him just like them. God can do that. And we need to realize tonight that God has not changed down through the hundreds and hundreds of years. I think about during a time like this, there are spiritual casualties. And that's unfortunate. But there are. Sadly to say, some, their vision for spiritual things is diminished. It's gone. Tonight, I'm glad to see everybody here. You know what that tells me? You still got a vision. But I'll guarantee you, brother, brother, uh, Abbey's church and churches around the country where they've been out of church for a while, there are people that will never darken the door again because they've lost their vision. Now they're pessimistic. They say, well, look, we did this for so many years, and look what happened, and man, we couldn't even go to church. But listen, our God is still in control. I think about some of what they do. They get pessimistic, and they, they lose their vision, and next thing you know, they go back to the old way. I'm not going back to the old way. I thought about that before. Do you know the life I had before I got saved? I would not give you two cents for a truckload of it. I wouldn't. But some today, uh, they're desiring the easy way. Well, it's a whole lot easier to stay home than come and have to. Do you realize what it was like to set these chairs up today? <laughs> it's a whole lot better having you all close together, hugging on each other. Amen. But, but people will say, we're just going to take the easy way. We're not going through all this nonsense. Got to put a gun to your head and check your temperature. Got to wear gloves. Got to wear a mask. They say, man, I'm taking the easy way. I'm just going to stay out. Or they prefer the way of man again. Hey, listen, man's way is not going to work. And if a person is saved and gets backslidden and they lose their vision and they go back to the ways of man, you mark it down, they'll be the most miserable of miserable people. And I thought about this. Today, the battle is as great as it was in David's day. It may not be a Philistine today, but you know what? It, it's all the imps and the demons of Satan that are attacking. This co coronavirus, it, it's not an accident. I think it's a political thing, personally. I mean, you look now, uh, we just mentioned this today out in the foyer, up in Kansas City, I think Terry confirmed it, the mayor or somebody in Kansas City has now is registering all the people that go to church in that city. Hey, that's nonsense. Crazy. But the devil's hands in this, God knows it, and God wants to see what we're made of. You remember what I said a few weeks ago? I said, you know how you know what's in the tea bag? You put it in hot water. We're going to find out what we're made of when we go through these kind of situations in our life. The enemies of our God and his people, listen, are very much alive today, just like they were back in David's day. There's no question about that. Look at 1 Samuel 17 again, and look at verse number 11. 
Many in Israel, in that army, they were afraid and they feared. They didn't want to fight. They didn't want to stand. Look at verse number 17. Or excuse me, chapter 17, verse 11. Look what verse 11, it says, When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now you say, why were they afraid of one guy? Well, I don't know if you realize, but Goliath was about 9 foot 9 inches tall, according to my, my figuring. He was a big guy and could have weighed an estimated six to 700 pounds. His, his spear was like a weaver's beam. I picture that as a four by four. The point on it, I want to say, weighed 15 pounds, and he had a coat of mail that weighed approximately 150 plus pounds, and he had some kind of an armor bearer going before him. That guy stood way more than head and shoulders above everybody, and they were scared to death. Look at verse number 24 of that same chapter, and I'm just showing you how Israel, the men in Israel were thinking. They were afraid. The enemy seemed so absolutely outrageously big and, and dangerous. In verse 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were so afraid. You know, David didn't run. What did David do? David stood his ground. He didn't, he didn't move. He didn't run. And he believed that there was a cause, and he was standing for that cause. He would not back down. And we've got to be the same way. What if they came, and they said here in Stockton, you know what, we're going to register all you church people. Are we going to ditch and run? Are we going to say, I'm not a Christian, and I don't go to church, and I don't belong to Faith Baptist Church? What are we going to do? It's something to think about. I think many today in God's army are the same way. I think there's a lot that do not want to stand. They don't want to stand. If it gets tough, they don't want to stand, and they don't want to fight. And you know what I think the biggest fight we all have is the fight, the, the temptation. We fight the temptation to compromise and quit. And everybody does. You can't tell me in here tonight that everybody at one time or another, somewhere in your life, you had a desire just to quit. But we can't quit. We've got to go on. We have to have a renewed vision and take action for God's glory. It's not for us, but it's for God. And I think about this. The cause for Christ is greater, uh, was great back then, and I think maybe it's greater now than it's ever been before. I think more doors have been opened up. I mentioned that thing on that night about prayer, about how that Donald Trump was the great-grandson of the two women in the Hebrides Islands that prayed and, had, and saw revival come. I don't know why Donald Trump's there. But he's got a spiritual background and his ancestry coming down. And he's got a Bible that was given to him by his mother that's in the Oval Office. You say, well, that don't mean anything. It might mean more than we realize. I, I think we've seen with him there are things that have taken place in the last four years that never took place in the previous eight years, like the day of prayer was a really important thing. And religious liberties are being upheld more than they were before. And we better not take that for granted, but we better understand that we're in a day right now that if we maintain our vision and get a greater vision, something wonderful can happen through the power of God. I want you to look with me tonight at different things a renewed vision will do. Look over at Nehemiah chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 3. The story of Nehemiah is an amazing story. Nehemiah had a burden for his city that had been destroyed. The walls were broken down and the gates were burned. And if you'll notice, uh, when we get a renewed vision, we will see that the cause of Christ is still worth standing for. It's still worth standing for. It's never changed. No more than it was in David's day, we should still stand. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 3, I want you to see here was his cause for standing. And he said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Now, think about this thing with Nehemiah. Nehemiah was what? What was his occupation? He was a cupbearer to the king. Now, when he came into the presence of the king that day, what was it, Brother Foot? He was acting a little different, wasn't he? That king could see that his countenance was not the same as normal. And that's a scary thing for a cupbearer because if they have a, a guilty look on their face or they have a nervous act, you know what the king might just do? Take them out and have them killed. Because maybe they poisoned the wine or they poisoned whatever the king's about to eat and they wouldn't take any chances. But that king loved him. And he said, I noticed, Nehemiah, there's something wrong. What is it? And he, read, he gave this quote that we just read in verse number three. He says, the city of my fathers and the gates of that city are burned. He says, that's the reason. 
But he took a stand on something. Even though he was a captive in a foreign land, he took a stand for the things of God. Look now, if you would, at chapter 6 of Nehemiah, and look at verses 2 and 3. And they began to rebuild the walls, and they began to rebuild the gates. They re began to rebuild the entire city. But it wasn't without, without anybody trying to oppose. And by the way, we still have people opposing this. You look at New York City, you look at all these cities, they got governors that saying, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that. I like down in Texas, there's a lady that owned a beauty salon. How many of you saw that story? Lady owned a beauty salon. She opened her beauty salon against the dictates of, of the government. And they took her and they said, uh, you've opened your business, you're not supposed to do that, you know, we're going to have to put you in jail. She said, you're more concerned about that than she said, my kids don't have food. My employees that work for me, they don't have money to buy food for their children. Their children are going hungry. And she said, if I've got to go to jail, then I'll go to jail. But here's the Lone Ranger came to the rescue. The governor of the state of Texas says she's not going to be in jail. Amen. Amen. He's standing up for what's right. And that's exactly what Nehemiah did. He did not compromise. Look at verse number 2. And here are two of those that were rebelling against him. That Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. These were guys were opposing the rebuilding of Jerusalem. They were. They didn't want anything to do with it. They were doing everything in their power they could to stop the rebuilding. You know what Nehemiah did, though? They got ready. They carried a, a tool in one hand. They carried a weapon in the other. And they said, if you hear the trumpet blow, wherever you hear it, you go there and we'll battle. He wasn't going to compromise. And then look at verse number 3. And I love what he said. The, he returned the message. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? You know what? We may have coronavirus. We may have all these different things going on. But that doesn't mean we got to stop. Amen? we got to keep going. We need to stand for the old King James Bible, folks. <laughs> we, have, we have a book that we've been looking at. The guy's got some really good devotions. It's a cowboy book, Jordan. It's really good. The guy was a world championship calf roper. I believe he's saved with all his heart. But he doesn't have any clue about the Bible. I mean, absolutely none whatsoever. And I tell my wife, and she says to me, she says, why in the world would somebody that loves the Lord so much use such corrupt garbage? We've got what God wants right here, folks. Let's not change it. Let's stand on it. I don't care how many times people ridicule, oh, you guys are those King James. Yeah, I'm King James. Amen? You're going to go with something, you might as well go with the best. Amen? I, and then I think about this. We need to still stand for godly standards. You, you know, and everybody thinks of standards, you automatically think of dress. I think we ought to have dress standards. I think we ought to obey dress standards according to the Bible. But there's a lot of standards. We ought, to, we ought to stand for Christ no matter where we're at. We ought to stand for the Bible. We ought to stand for righteousness and holiness. We ought to stand for all of that stuff and not ever compromise. You may be going through this coronavirus thing and everybody else in our community, but we ought to be a little different than everybody else. We ought to have a smile on our face and not a frown or be frumpy. We ought to stand for what is right, and that's our Lord. Amen. Amen. Look at Matthew 5 and verse 14. Talking about the light of the world. She doesn't like me anyway. <laughs> that little girl, those other two children, they would smile at me. Every time they smiled, that was $100 in their bank account. I have been deducting from Aurelia's bank account. I mean... <laughs> Tonight, I walked over there. Do you see what she did? I said something. She looked at me and went. <laughs> she didn't even give me a second look. I couldn't believe it. Uh, anyway, look at Matthew 5 and look at verse 14. It says, ye are the what? Light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light, what? So shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Some years ago, I had a computer program, and it had the different customs over in the Bible times. And it talks about that bushel, put a candle under a bushel, no, and that song we know. 
Most of the houses were very simple houses. They were square. Uh, they would have a lattice. That's where they light the fire. The smoke would go out. But anyway, that bushel basket during the day was an implement or an instrument they would use to carry things. But at night, that basket was turned upside down, and that became the lamp stand. Now, here's what was important. If you were to walk by a house and you saw no light in the house, that would tell you what? Nobody was home. But when the light was in there, that said that somebody was home and that basically they were friendly. You know, I think it's the same thing with you and I. If we don't let our light shine, you, you know what? They'll think there's nobody in here. Amen? Who am I talking about? The Lord Jesus. And when our, we let our light shine, they can see that Christ lives inside. There's somebody alive in here. And we need that. I think of how the Lord Jesus stood for us. He endured the impossible because he had a vision for our salvation. And each one of us need to have a personally renewed vision of what we must stand for. We'll never have to endure what Christ did. And sometimes we say, man, it's just too tough. I just can't stand. Really? What are we going through that compares anything to what Christ went through? But then look at Matthew 28. Here's the second thing. With a renewed vision, we will see that the cause of Christ is worth going for. I really can't say a whole lot about our church when it comes to going. We have anywhere from 25 to 40 people out every Saturday morning. And by the way, when we're able to gather again, let's not let that down. It's been a blessing. Our community knows that Faith Baptist Church is on the map. They know that. Uh, you'll go to a house and you'll knock on the door. Oh, somebody from your church was just here. That's a blessing. That's what it's all about. But we need to have a, a vision and maybe a renewed vision uh, to see that Christ is still worth going for. Matthew 28 in verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. That verse is so important. Many people will not go out and they'll not knock doors, they'll not visit, they'll not witness because they're afraid. They say, I just can't do that. I don't have the ability to do that. You know what? We have all the power of Jesus Christ at our disposal if we just ask for it. Amen. And then look what it says in verse 19. It says, go ye therefore and what? Teach. That word literally means to make disciples of. To make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. God's plan has never changed when it comes to soul winning. I mean, when you stop and think about it, why did Christ come to this earth? He came for one reason, and that was to see the lost souls saved. And God's heartbeat is still to reach every lost person on the face of this earth. Christ died for us. He paid a great price, and that price was his own life. He shed his own blood. And again, we, each of us, need to have a renewed vision of how to reach the lost at any cost. I was asked just yesterday, I was asked by a gentleman that Terry and I know, he's a, he's a fine gentleman. He said, Brother Bill, of all the things you've done in all the places you've been, what, what has impacted you the most in your life? I said, number one, it would be salvation. But number two, it's the influence we have on other people that we never know. Everybody in this building tonight has influence. You're going to either have a good influence or a bad influence, but we're going to influence people. I always tell this story, and I told it to him yesterday, and, and I'm not patting myself on the back because I had no idea about it. I was just doing what God called me. I used to do the gun thing, and over the years, I, you know, we traveled for many, many years doing that, and this was probably in 2001 or 2002. We were in Ohio, and we were in a revival meeting, and the pastor asked me if I wanted to go to a fellowship. I'm not a big fellowship guy, but I said, if you want to go, I'll go with you, and so we went. And it was a big church, and they had missionaries there, and they had evangelists there. They had all kinds of people, and several got up and gave a testimony about their work. Well, one boy, when I say a boy, he was probably in his mid to late 20s, and he got up and he said, I'm a church planner. I'm going to Idaho, and I'm going to start churches. Well, when they got done, we were going back to have a meal, and I stopped in the restroom to wash my hands, and that young man was in there. And I said to him, I said, you're going to Idaho to start churches. I said, the West is so desperately in need of churches. I mean, anywhere out there that you stop and you start a church would be a great place. I said, I pastored out in, in the West in Wyoming for 11 years. And I said, I had a Western ministry and I have a burden for the West. 
And when I said a Western ministry, that young man just stopped in his tracks and he looked at me like that. He said, you had a Western ministry? I said, yes. He said, you didn't shoot a gun, did you? I said, yes, I did. He said, you're not the gospel gunfighter. I said, yes, I am. You know, that brought me down, humbled me, to think that the meetings we had, you never anticipate that. But that young man's life was influenced. He got saved in a meeting when he was a boy. I had no idea about it. And you have no idea when you go out and you have that fresh vision for Stockton and Cedar County and El Dorado Springs and Bolivar and Humansville, you have no idea who you're going to touch and whose life you're going to affect. Right. But we've got to keep going because without that vision, people will perish. And not only will they perish and die and go to hell, but also the Christian will backslide will not live for God the way they should. Here's another one. Look at 1 Samuel 12 and look at verse 22 and 23. With a renewed vision, we will see that the cause of Christ is worth praying for. And I hit this real hard three weeks ago, but you can't say enough about prayer. The cause of Christ is worth praying for. In 1 Samuel 12 and verse 22 and verse 23, it says, For the Lord will not forsake his people, for his great namesake, because I had pleased the Lord to make you his people. Samuel was talking to Israel. And you know, Israel was like a spiritual yo-yo, up and down with the Lord and back away from the Lord. But notice verse 23, what he says. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should what? What's that next word? Sin against the Lord and what? Ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good in the right way. He said right there, prayerlessness is a direct what? Sin against God. When we have a renewed vision, you're going to understand more than ever before that prayer is so vital. We can't be everywhere at all times, but you mark it down when we pray, God is. I wonder how many of you still, how, no, I'm not going to ask that. I wonder how many of you have the last prayer bulletin we had before we had to dismiss. When's the last time you prayed for it? We need to pray and get serious about this thing of prayer. There are people on that prayer list that we have been praying for for years. I think about the Martins. Pray for them every day. I think about different ones. I think about the Pernard's children and all of them on the prayer list. Uh, we need to pray. You say, well, nothing's happening. We have no idea what God's doing. And I always like to remind myself and tell the one, too, about Gladys Carter and Clint were in Daint, Virginia. She was 102 years old when she died. She was 100 years old sitting in a church service. And I remember, was, were we there that day? Yes, they got saved that day. We were there and the pastor gave the invitation and people came forward to get saved. And a man and a woman got up and walked down the aisle and they both got saved. They were 71 years old each. Guess who they were? They were Gladys Carter's son and his daughter-in-law. She would prayed for him for 70 some years. She never lost her vision for God saving her children. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to what? Pray and not to faint. You know, the Lord Jesus prayed, leaving us an example. Did he have to pray? No, but he did it, leaving us an example. And I think without a doubt that each one of us needs to get a personal, renewed vision and get confidence in our prayers that God will answer our prayers when we're right with him. And here's something else I thought about. This now I lay me down to sleep type prayer. We don't need those kind of prayers. What we need is specific prayers. I thought about the model prayer. If you go down through that model prayer, there's specific things in that prayer that God asks the people to pray for and pray about. And we need to be specific about it. You say, well, uh, boy, I've just been praying and praying and praying, but nothing happened. I think of the story I told last week about my father-in-law. We specifically prayed for two and a half months, specifically prayed. And in two and a half months, he got saved. Now, I don't know that that'll happen in every case, but I know it sure happened there. And he had rejected for years and years and years and years. But I think it was that specific prayer that made the difference. But then look at 2 Timothy 2.15. Here's another. With a renewed vision, we'll still see that the cause of Christ is worth studying for. I was amazed when I was in evangelism. I like to do a 
a quiz every night before we'd start the service, go over things that we'd had, and sometimes you'd have a verse and you'd say part of a verse and you'd leave it out, and it was amazed to see how many people could not complete that. You and I in here tonight, we need to be students of the Bible. We do. And the, the more we realize that, that Christ is still the focal point and he's the most important thing is the more we should study and learn more about the Bible. Look at 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be what? Ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, how many of you play games on your phone? Now, I'll be honest. Let me see your hands. Slip them up high. Come on. Come on. Yeah, okay. Everybody's holding their hand down. I don't want to. My wife got me started. <laughs> well, what can I say? She's a bad influence from time to time. <laughs> but I got one on there. there. There's one that you have words, and you have to figure out what the words mean. I play that one. But there's another one, and it's a Bible program. And it's a Bible quiz program. Betty, I'll tell you what, it can be challenging. There's about six different categories that you can punch on, and it comes up, it'll leave out a word, it'll be a, a place or a book in the Bible. Hey, listen, that's the kind of stuff we ought to be doing instead of playing the dumb games and watching the television and playing the videos and all that other nonsense, so we'll be prepared. Amen. <laughs> you know, the definition of study means this. It means to make an effort, and a good effort, by the way. How many in high school you didn't put much effort forward? Yes, amen. <laughs> it means to be diligent. It means to labor or endeavor. You say, man, those are hard words. That means I'd have to work at it. Yeah, that's exactly what it's saying. But that word rightly dividing, this is good too. It means to cut a straight line. It doesn't mean to go off to the left and go off to the right. Well, this is what I think, or this is what the commentary said. No, this is what the Bible says. Amen. You need to read your Bible. You need to study your Bible. Now, we have these little notebooks in the bookstore. They're only two bucks. I got one myself. You ought to have one of those. How many of you ever come across a word you don't know what it means? We all do. The rest of you could raise your hands too. Some, somebody tell me what adramidium means. All you Bible scholars. Come on, adramidium, what's it mean? Mansion of death. Eurocladin. Who knows what Eurocladin is? Come on, y'all didn't raise your hands. It's in the Bible. It means a fierce, violent storm. But when you come to a word you don't know what it is, take that little $2 notebook you're going to buy. <laughs> Plug in it. We got a lot of them. <laughs> and write it down, and then after you're done, go back and look it up and put it. Listen, you will enjoy your Bible so much more. Or there's a verse you don't quite understand what it is. It means, put that verse down, and then go back and study that verse out. Amen. But you need to meditate on it, too. We have so many things that clog our mind during the day. Really do. If you meditate on the Bible, you'll, you'll stay clear-headed. Amen? And you know what else we need to do most of all? You know how I try to carry my Bible? And not that I'm anybody, but I read this somewhere. You know what this is? That's kind of disrespectful. This is close to our heart. And the Bible ought to be something we hold in high esteem. Don't lay other things on your Bible. Don't, don't abuse your Bible. Take care of your Bible. Love your Bible. Christ gave us this book as a guidebook for every bit of our living. And it's all in there. What we knew, we need each one of us a renewed vision about the Word of God and have a desire to learn more about it. But then the last thing, look if you would at Luke chapter 6, and, well, no, there's two more things I like. But I'm still not going to break preacher's record. How many of you tried to watch Sunday? Buddy, it was tough. I was a, what are they, I was a defector on Sunday. By the way, pray for my kids. They've lost their minds. 
They moved to Texas. <laughs> anyway, so we watched, we watched the church they're going to go to. You better, you better praise the Lord for Pastor Grandy. That pastor went an hour and 36 minutes. My wife had to splash water on me to keep me awake. <laughs> but look at Luke 6, 38. With a renewed vision, we'll see the cause of Christ is still worth giving for. In Luke 6, 38, it says, Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosoms, for with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You know, we need to be willing to give monetarily. And listen, I can't say one thing about the, the, the tithes and the offerings of the people of Faith Baptist Church. It's been amazing, absolutely amazing. We hear the results of the money that have come in, and, and it's just that pastor is just astounded. But we all need to be willing to give. I think also this, give material things too. Now you say, what do you mean by material? You know, we have the tithe, and we have offerings for missionaries, and we have for guest speakers. But you know, what about when people have a need? And I know we have some that do that. You've already done it. But I think about we had the VBS, and we had the junior church program for the spring that we were going to have. We had the missions conference that was coming up. We had the boxes back there. And we were trying to get folks just to give. Do you know, when you give in donations like that, you're giving to the cause of Christ. You're giving for the good of the ministry, and you're going, giving for the good of people all around the world, literally, with the missionaries, and we never know where the juniors are going to go when they grow up, or VBSers, but we need to be willing to give material as, as well. But then I think also this about our time, and can't really complain about that either, but I have to throw this in. How can you preach a message without talking about giving, amen? Well, that got real quiet. <laughs> but give of your time. Give of your talents. I say this all the time. We have such a talented group of people here and people that are willing to give their time and their talents. That's a blessing. But we need to have a renewed vision. Don't just get in a rut and say, well, I already do this. Well, there might be something else the Lord wants you to do. But we need to keep our mind open and do exactly what the Lord would have. And we get that by renewing our vision, having a dream of what God wants us to do. We all need to think of how he gave himself without holding back anything, and he did it just for you and I. But then look at 1 Corinthians 12, and verse, verses 12 and 18. With a renewed vision, we will see that the cause of Christ is worth being responsible and accountable for. Whether you realize it or not, everybody in here tonight, under the sound of my voice, from the youngest person to the oldest, one day we're going to give account for our Christian life and what we've done. Look at verse number 12 of chapter 12. It says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. I think about this, and I've often used this example too. If you think about Tim Malloy, Tim Malloy is probably one of the most amazing men I've ever met. Most people, if you were in Tim's condition, you know what you would do? You'd do nothing. What's Tim doing now, Brother Jordan? He's got a group of boys, and he's working at the ranch, and he's painting. Now, it is cool. The boys paint the upper three rungs. Tim paints the three bottom rungs because he's on his bottom. He, he's got a, it's like a pad or something that he can scoot around, around on the ground. Now, let me ask you this. When, let's see, what hand? It was this hand went first. This hand, he lost his pinky and his thumb. Now, you know what that would do to most people? Most people, that would handicap you to the place where you'd probably drop into deep depression and you wouldn't want to do anything. You know what Tim did? Tim still did everything he used to do. And then they took the hand, and then they took it off, I think, just below the elbow. That didn't hold him back. We go out when the brandings. You know what Tim did? Tim was right-handed, but Tim learned how to rope left-handed. He'd tie hard and fast because he couldn't dally anymore. But he was roping like gangbusters with a left hand. He never did it. Okay, and then so uh, they took the pinky and the thumb off of that hand. Didn't slow him up, just kept going. And then, finally, his foot got bad. They took his toes off, I think, first, and they took the foot, they took it above the ankle, took it below the knee, and then they took it off right up here. You know what most people have done then? Sat back and whined and cried and, and, and just were, were a mess. 
I remember the day, and I don't know if you were there, Jordan, I remember the day when Riley fixed his saddle. You say, he got on a horse? Oh, yeah. I remember the day that he did it. He had his left hand, his right foot. He got on the right side of the horse. He's a man's man, by the way. He grabbed that horn, and he jumped and pulled himself up and stabbed that right stirrup and swung into that saddle and slid his thump into that pocket, and off Tim Malloy went. But you know what? When you lose a digit or you lose a limb, it handicaps the entire body. Tim can't do what he used to do, but he's still doing. And I think about this. The cause of Christ is still is worthy to be accountable for and responsible for because we're part of the body. And you wouldn't think of that, but you just picture yourself as a pinky finger. You picture yourself as a thumb on the body. You picture yourself as the toes on the left foot, or you picture the, the, the leg on the, the right side. And by the way, they had to amputate both his legs, and now he's only got stumps this long. But when that happens, if you lose the pinky or you lose the thumb and you lose the foot, it handicaps the entire body, and the body cannot do what it once did. And everybody sitting here tonight is part of the body of Christ. And if you and I are not doing our part, we're handicapping the whole. And we need to do our part. And I'm not, I'm not chastising anybody. I'm encouraging I think we have a wonderful group of people and we have a wonderful church, but I think the greatest and the most wonderful days yet lie ahead for Faith Baptist Church. But in verse 18, it goes on to finish that. It says, but now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. He has, you're not here by accident tonight. God has put you exactly where you're at, and he has a job and a purpose for you. Each member in here tonight has a God-given responsibility. I can't fulfill your responsibility. I think of even these children in here tonight that are saved. If they're saved, they have a responsibility. They do. And one day, we're going to have to give account for it. Romans 14, verse 11 says this, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, listen to this, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Each member of the body will be held accountable. Nobody will be exempt from it, no matter how young or how old, if they're saved. We don't want to handicap the body. I know this. I want to do the very best I can as a Christian, number one, and as a preacher, number two. I don't want to handicap Faith Baptist Church. I really would never want to do that. And I think of how that Christ fulfilled all the requirements God had for him, and he did it so he could just save us. You realize our life will be a whole lot easier, more enjoyable, and more productive if we get a renewed vision. You say, well, how often should I do it? I think you ought to get up every morning and have a vision of what you're going to do for God that day. David's vision for things of God was not deterred by the enemy. And I thought about this. I wrote it down. COVID-19 should not cause us to lose our vision, but it should enhance it, realizing time is getting short. And I believe that. I believe right now you can find people that are going to be willing to ask you questions that they never would ask before. You say, well, how do I do this? What is the solution? Well, I think, number one, you need to submit to the Holy Spirit and to the will of God for your life. Number two, I think you need to seek out Pastor Grandy. You say, that's crazy. No, it's not. Why don't you seek out our pastor and go up to him and sit down with him and say, Pastor, preacher, what is your vision for our church? What is it exactly is it that you want to see happen in our church? And let's learn what his vision for our church is. He's our leader. And then say, Pastor, how can I help fulfill that vision that we can bring glory to God? Everybody in here tonight can do that. There's not a person that, that can't if you want to. And that's the key. Do you know why David beat Goliath? Because he loved God. He was not afraid to stand for truth. And he was willing to do whatever it took. And I think that's where we all need to be. Let's bow our heads, please. Our heads bowed and our eyes are closed. And we're not going to have an invitation like normal. We, it's pretty hard to do that. But I wonder tonight if there might be one that would say this. 
my prayer is that God would help me to have a renewed vision for him every day. How many of you this evening, that would be your prayer? Let me see your hand. Just slip it up. Amen. Father, I thank you tonight for these folks that have come out. What a blessing it is to see people in the house of God again. And Father, you've seen all the hands that went up. And I pray for each one of those tonight that you would fulfill that desire that they have. And Father, for those that may not have the desire yet, that you would burn it in their heart, make them see and realize the importance of having a vision for you and not quitting and not giving up. And Lord, tonight we ask you to be of our pastor. Please raise him up. Heal him, Lord, and get him back on his feet to where he's feeling good. And Lord, we look forward to Sunday and the services on Sunday morning and Sunday night. Lord, we look forward to the day when there are no more restrictions and we can openly come and worship together and go out and knock doors and serve the Lord as you desire. And Father, we're going to praise you tonight for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, Val, why don't you just play a little bit? And what we're going to do is the ushers, if you guys would get in the back,